When you think of a ghost town, your mind likely wanders to the swinging saloon doors and dusty roads of the American West. Our collective mind's eye views a ghost town as being a place where gunfighters once duked it out in the street as tumbleweeds and antelope went by. But what you may not be surprised to know is that the United States of America is littered with towns that once saw booms and busts. And from sea to shining sea, it is these root cellars and meandering stone walls that tell a story of trial and tribulation on the American frontier. It's a topic that I've always been fascinated with. People who were willing to leave behind everything they knew in order to try and forge a life for themselves somewhere where the map ends and the wilderness begins. And it is for that very reason that I find myself today in a very unassuming place for a ghost town. Because it is here in the woods of north central Vermont, set against a scenic landscape of rolling hills and majestic forests, that we find ourselves standing atop the remains of one of these ghost towns. And while to the untrained eye this place may just look like another scenic covered bridge and a couple old cellar holes, in reality they there is a story to be told here. Which is why, ladies and gentlemen, on this glorious fall day, I would like to take you with me so I can tell you the story of To call the mountains that I walk on now ancient would be an understatement. While the landscape around me consists of these beautiful rolling hills for which Vermont is known, these mountain ranges are actually hundreds of millions of years old. There is a spider web floating. Get out of here. I also had to take my sweater off. I vastly overestimated how hot it was gonna be today. I also vastly overestimated how hot you get climbing around in a river trying to carry a goddamn camera and a sweater. Vermont's Green Mountains are a shadow of their former selves. Originally, this mountain range was pushed up almost half a billion years ago. And at the time, it would have been a majestic range, something with jagged peaks that would resemble more the Himalayas than the rolling hills and landscapes that it is today. However, over the course of hundreds of millions of years of erosion and weathering, it has been worn down to these handful of smooth stones in this creek bed. If you want to learn more about the geology of Vermont, I just did a video uh, exploring the Chazy Fossil Reef uh, which is also in Vermont. That's a pretty cool one. It's a 480 million year old coral reef, uh, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep on with this video for now. Now, traditionally, the land that we walk on now uh, is home to the Abenaki people, the indigenous group of northern New England. The groups that would have occupied this area traditionally would have been the Massasquoi and the, oh, damn, what was the other one? Winooski, I believe. And they are by far the longest lasting human presence in this part of the world. And while this area bears um, many European names as well as legal land holdings and has been divvied up to become the country that we now know as America, the Abenaki people and the indigenous groups who rightfully own this land are still very much present here. However, our story begins a little bit after this. The year is 1795, and as Europeans expand north, they begin looking for new opportunity in the Green Mountains. That match went out. In order to encourage utilization of this virgin land, they began to hand out a mill contract. And it was one of these mill contracts that we find the beginning of our story. The year is 1795, and a portion of Joe's Brook, which flows next to me now, was deeded off for use as mill land. The natural topography allowed for a uh, mill to be constructed that could run off of the hydropower, which is a running theme that you will see in many early New England settlements in places like Lowell that became known for their mill production during the Industrial Revolution. And the town became a small bastion of civilization in an otherwise vast and unadulterated wilderness. Wilderness. It was no metropolis by any means, but it was a small beacon of hope for many of the European travelers who were coming through this area. But in order to see the true beating heart of this massive industrial operation, we have to go a little ways down the river that way.
unassuming stone wall behind me is all that is left of what was once the lifeblood of this small but thriving community. The original claim from the late 1790s for this mill location went to a Mr. Bolton, who was the first one to build a mill at this site. However, it wasn't until 1849 that Benjamin Greenbank could get his hands on the property and turn what was a small community into a thriving mini metropolis in the woods. And it is by this scenic brook in 1849 that Greenbank built the Vermont Valley Woolen Mill. And for 30 years, business boomed for Greenbank and his small town. Over the course of 30 years, Greenbank would work to expand his industry, creating what would be the largest woolen mill in the entirety of the northeastern United States. And by the 1870s, this building with its humble beginnings would reach a staggering five stories. And the entire operation was powered by a dam which ran across the stream behind me, flooding the area that we were actually just sitting to create a mill pond. A mill pond is essentially a giant natural battery. By storing water behind it, you can uh, orchestrate and dictate how much flows through and therefore be able to base your operations accordingly. And by utilizing the natural resources in this valley, Green Bank was able to set himself up pretty well. And at the heyday, this mill was able to produce a staggering 700 yards of woolen textile per day. And as business grew, so did the little community. And slowly but surely, Green Bank's textile industry turned into a small, bustling hamlet hidden away in the mountains. And where there is successful industry, people are sure to follow. And so, as Benjamin Greenbank's woolen operation continued to see renewed success, a small town began to form in these woods. Now, while right now it may just look like there is a beflanneled man sitting in a hole in the woods, in reality, this was once the post office and general store for this small community. And not only did Greenbank's Hollow establish a post office and general store, but it also had... This house, which would go on to be the home of one of the sons of Mr. Benjamin Greenbank himself, and site where I just filmed the clip where I accidentally destroyed some of it. John Franco, roll the clip. This house. Oh, fuck. Milo, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, I just broke the code of archaeological ethics. Why do you ask? Context has been restored. Fear not. What kind of archaeologist would I be if I didn't violate my own code of ethics every once in a while? Okay, let me get out of here without breaking something. And if we go just a little ways down this way, we will come across the ruins of the old boarding house. It was fairly commonplace for mill towns to have a residence of some kind for miners, mill workers, and other people who were traveling through. And here in the town of Green Banks Hollow, uh, here was one of those two also as well. Moving swiftly along. Boarding house? More like boring house. Seriously, look at that, I don't, I don't see much of a house. And then, if we just do a little hop, skip, and a jump down here, where we can find the ruin of another residential home funded by Benjamin Greenbank. There was even a majestic and iconic Vermont piece of architecture, a covered bridge, a replica of which I stand on today. Quick fun fact about the covered bridges, by the way. There was a time in the early 1800s when they uh, really loved building these things because they're beautiful and functional, but there was a period in history where people then thought that they were unsightly, so they started tearing all of them down, meaning that the actual amount of covered bridges left in New England that are original is very slim. Unfortunately, for reasons that I'll explain shortly, this is also a replica. Well, now a precariously poised hillside ruin, this used to be the home of Matthew Greenbank, the son of the infamous Benjamin Greenbank. Why he decided to build on this hill, I couldn't tell you. If I was like, where is a safe place I could put my wife and kids? I probably would not immediately opt for a cliff face, but then again, I didn't grow, grow up in a goddamn wool factory. And here, where now stands a gigantic ass kiosk and a bunch of majestically blowing pine needles, was the remains of the Greenbank School, <clears throat> where one would be presumably taught how to wool for the rest of their life. How to be a professional woolman. How to be a professional woman. Oh damn, they got some cool historic pictures over here. I'm taking some pictures so we can put them in the video. Oh yeah, they have my reflection on them. You guys are gonna love this. This foundation, which was home to, and I cannot believe I'm saying this, uh, the Adams family, moving along, as well as a house foundation that is in this guy's just comedically beautiful yard. This grist mill, the grist mill was originally built in 1786, but the rendition you see behind me was built in 1875 and worked to process the grain that was grown by the farmers in the local area. 
While Benjamin Greenbank's mill worked to process wool, many of the people around here were uh, subsistence farmers or at least agriculturally based. So having a grist mill was just as important as having another form in of industry. There was even a sawmill which worked to take advantage of the vast quantity of natural timber resources that were present in the area. What is interesting is that the original mill that was purchased by Benjamin Greenbank was actually started as a timber mill because the timber resources in the greater northeast area were vast and seemed practically unlimited, which we now know that they weren't. But before land could be cleared for agriculture and as well as animal husbandry like wool production that would go on to sustain this mill, all of the land needed to be cleared and therefore having a way to process the timber was a vital part of the local economy. I now realize I probably don't need to be yelling this loud. And last but not least, the home of Benjamin Greenbank himself located directly across the street from his masterpiece of a five-story wool mill building. And all of this industry could be best defined as a company town. A company town being something which you saw cropping up a lot in the late 1800s and early 1900s during the industrial boom in the Americas. Something where a wealthy, typically businessman would uh, be able to invest in a massive business venture, and as that venture took off and he began to produce more and more capital, he could literally just buy up all the land around it and create his own town. And so, much like many of the gold and logging communities in the American West, Green Bank saw a massive boom with the industry of the mill. But since much of the land was owned by Benjamin Greenbank himself, it was pretty much just his community that he owned. And as a result, the general store and post office and other forms of retail could be classed as company stores, making almost a self-sustaining economy within this tiny community, where people would go their day-to-day -day lives working at the mill and then spending money at Green Bank's store, creating a tiny little microcosm. This also resulted in a massive boom in the sheep farming industry in the local area, with many other communities also profiting from Green Bank's mill because they could sell their woolen wares in order to be processed and sold for higher profits elsewhere. But this self-sustaining capitalist microcosm was hinged by one cornerstone. That, of course, being Benjamin Green Bank's enormous five-story wooden wool mill. And a cornerstone is great. It holds everything together. But the downside of it is if the cornerstone disappears, everything falls apart. And considering I'm speaking to you from the ruined entranceway of a post office that hasn't existed for over a hundred years, I think you can see where this story is going. The story of the Vermont Valley Woolen Company, which saw such unbelievable success, ends as so many do abruptly. It is a cold, dark night on December 14th of 1864, and the inhabitants of the little town of Greenbanks Hollow slumber peacefully in their winter wonderland. And while those employed by this facility rest in order to work up their strength for the next day of work, the nightly security detail is making their rounds throughout the five-story mill complex. In the wee hours of the morning, one of these security guards pauses on the third floor of this massive wooden building. And as he takes a load off for a minute's pause, he hangs his lantern on a nail on one of the posts. And as fate would have it, this nail had had enough of things being hung on it, and allegedly it gave way. And so the nail, as well as the lantern full of fuel that it was supporting, tumble to the ground and shatter. Now on its own, that is a recipe for disaster. A wooden building whose floorboards have now been drenched in flaming kerosene or whale oil that once fueled the lamp. But what made matters even worse is that the process that they used in order to prepare the wool involved using a flammable material. And it is the agents that they used to prepare this wool that had soaked into the floorboards over the past 50 years of use. And so this five-story wooden building became essentially a giant firebomb. Almost immediately the third floor was completely engulfed in flame. As residents from the surrounding community came to the inferno, they tried to rescue everything they could from inside the building. Greenbank and his three sons were at the forefront of trying to fight the blaze and rescue whatever they could from the inside. But against the biting cold of a New England December night and the scorching inferno of this massive pyre, there was almost nothing that could be done. And so for two hours, the Vermont Valley Woolen Mill, which had once made up the lifeblood of this community, burned like a dying star in the cold December night. Legend has it that the hellish blaze that took place at this mill nearly a hundred years ago burned so bright that it was visible from St. Johnsbury nearly five miles away over the rolling hills. And as the inferno reached its peak, it began to spread, jumping away from the five stories of smoldering rubble it had left behind and burning with it the bridge, the post office, as well as Greenbank's home right across the street. The townspeople did all they could to fight the blaze, but unfortunately, as it so often does, nature won out. And defeated, the townspeople were left to stand back as the fire consumed whatever it wanted. And the only option left to them was to retreat to a safe distance and wait until the morning.
By the time the smoke had cleared on the morning of December 15th, most of the townspeople knew that all had been lost. Not only had the entirety of the mill building burned and collapsed into Joe's Creek, but the covered bridge that made up the only access point across the river and therefore connected them to civilization had also burned and now laid a smoldering ruin in the river below. Along with this, the loss of the post office and general store, as well as some of the surrounding buildings, had left the townspeople with essentially nothing. And with their hub of industry as well as their only connection to the outside world destroyed, the people of Greenbanks Hollow were left alone to pick up the pieces. Almost immediately, the town of Greenbanks Hollow saw a massive decline in population, as people who used to rely on its industry to feed their families saw no opportunity here anymore. And so, with no reason to stay, many of them packed their bags and left to the nearby communities, places like the nearby community of Danville and St. Johnsbury. And while some families did try to stay, none were successful enough in being able to find the proverbial phoenix in the ashes of their former lives. And so, with one weak nail and a shatter of broken glass, a community was destroyed, and the ripple effect this disaster had reached far beyond these quiet stone walls and meandering rivers. To provide wool for this industry, there were nearly 15,000 sheep in the Danville area in the 1870s, and in the 1860s it was this mill that created the uniforms that the Union soldiers wore into combat during the American Civil War. But after the last family left, nature began to take its toll, and over time this tiny hamlet has been reclaimed by the wilderness. It wasn't even until 2004 that anything was done with this location, at which point informational signs were installed and conservation techniques were applied in order to make sure that it stays a valuable educational site for future generations. So if you ever find yourself in this quiet corner of Vermont, just a few miles south of the town of Danbury, I would encourage you to pay a visit to this location. And as you walk through the quiet foundations and the whispering leaves of the deciduous trees, I want you to try and think about the people who once lived here, where for over a hundred years this place housed a community, a place where people loved, laughed, and lost, and a a place where if it weren't for the inconspicuous roadside signs, you would probably never even notice. And yet if these stones could only speak, they would tell us a story of rise and fall, of boom and bust. And they would tell us the story of a place which today is only marked by a sign that reads, The Forgotten Town of Greenbanks Hollow. I'd like to thank you all very much for watching and for humoring this slightly different video. I've been thoroughly enjoying actually going out and uh, doing some hands-on stuff, so I hope that that hasn't been too insufferable. Also, as of yesterday, at the time of me filming this, I hit 600,000 subscribers, which is fucking nuts. I don't know how to wrap my head around that number. So if this is the first actual video you've seen by me, I hope you enjoyed it. It is a little bit different than my normal content, but I'm sure that you will like both equally. And if you are a returning viewer, then of course, welcome back, and it's wonderful to see you again. I would like to thank each and every one of you for watching this video, and I'd like to give a special thank you to my patrons for making what I do here possible. If you would like to become a patron, the link to that is in the description below, and patrons get early ad-free access to all of my videos, as well as some of the higher tiers getting access to outtake reels, which I will eventually release, but for now, they are exclusive. If you're a fan of what I do here, make sure to subscribe, and I will be seeing you in the next one. As always, remember to stay curious, stay inquisitive, and most importantly, remember that if you see something on the side of the road that catches your eye, it is almost always worth stopping, because you never know what secrets it might have to tell you. <laughs>